We are on part two of Nurturing Spirituality, which is, I think, part 11 of our series on spiritual formation. And I I have brought the reading of Scripture to be something that youth do to start our services because as we talk about what it means to grow and what it means to have our, uh, our spirit within us be formed, as Christians we declare that Scripture is God's Word. And therefore it is um, not, not just primary, it is extremely important and extremely primary above all things. But on top of that too, we believe that we should be reading it, reading it out loud, and that... You don't have to be gifted in a lot of ways to bless the church body. And so one simple thing that we can do is have kids read scripture to start our services because it gives them practice with public speaking. Many people grow into their adulthood and they've never been pushed to simply learn how to do something publicly. So this gives them practice for that. But not only that, but if, as we continue to do this year after year after year, we are re-ingraining re in our hearts just the Psalms, which has been for 3,000 years the worship of the church. And you'll notice that some of the Psalms are lament and just really down in the dirt. Other ones are jubilation. And the Psalms teach us that it is okay to have the range of emotions as humans because we have a God that we can go to with all of our emotions. So today as we're going to talk about our spiritual formation, I want to talk about discipleship. Now, did those get printed out? Question for Carrie and did we get them printed? All right, my apologies, they did not get printed out, the slides, but we will get handouts in future weeks. That is an issue of they didn't, I was not able to get them printed on Friday. And then Sunday mornings get very busy as we try to get other stuff planned. So first slide um, after this, I want to just a basic question of what is discipleship? Now, before I read the definition, I want us to have just an understanding. We are discipled by any content that we consume, whether intentional or unintentional. We are taught and we are trained by what we are fed. Now, part of discipleship, as I'll get to later, is the ability to weed out good from bad, the ability to withstand and endure things that are bad. <clears throat> but I want you to just realize that what you take in is discipling you. This has actually been one of the most common refrains of pastors in the last six to eight years, as pastors say, how can I, or how can my church, disciple people to be more like Jesus if people are consuming 15, 20, 30 hours of media that's telling them to act, think, and be different than what we're doing with our one hour on Sunday morning? So I want to give this just as a warning and a start of all this is you are being discipled. The question is, by what? And by who? So discipleship in the context of a church is the learning of and the conforming to the will, word, and way of God. So discipleship is understanding what God wants and then the training and the encouragement of people to go that way. So discipleship is something that we do, and it's also something that we receive. This is something that has been part of the way of God's people all the way since the calling of the people from out of Egypt with Deuteronomy 6, which I'm going to read in a little bit. But, read, but I want you to hear Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, which is up on the board. I'm going to read it out loud because this is discipleship at a core. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? If 
by living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Discipleship is teaching people God's word. Discipleship is calling people to purity, to holiness. Discipleship is helping people hide God's word in their heart. Or, bad discipleship is training people to stay how they are and keep their habits and stay in their own ways. The, Bible, the New Testament model for discipleship is found in Acts 2, verse 42, where it says that the early church, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And Proverbs 1, 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Discipleship comes from the same word that the Greeks would have used for learning. It was the same sort of term that someone who is in an internship or someone who is learning a trade, this is, they're learning that, they're being discipled into it. So just as an electrician goes from not knowing anything or being untrained to them being trained to them becoming a journeyman who can train others, we as believers, we recognize that people are on the full spectrum of either not knowing God's way, which is part of the evangelism, where people who are called out of darkness into light, or people who are believers but don't know much of scripture to then people who are equipped and empowered to actually train someone else to know the will, way, and word of God. Now the beauty and the challenge of this is that as we see in Acts 2 verse 42, this is not something that is done in isolation where one person does it for themselves, but rather it is what the believers as a whole are supposed to be doing. Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Discipleship is a, almost always the context of a group of people. It can frequently be one-on-one, -on -one, but if we are trying to learn and be closer to what God wants and desires, think about how often if you're only being if it's only one person on learning with one person, or one person teaching everyone, what does Scripture say about a single stream of information? Or a single training? Does that line up with what Romans 12, Ephesians 4, or 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 says about the gifts and the multitude? In Ephesians 4, it says that there are Prophets, teachers, preachers, and evangelists for building up the church. It doesn't say that there is a teacher who teaches. It says that there's a gift, and it takes all of them. So as the early church devoted themselves together to the apostles' teaching, it said they were also devoted to fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. Discipleship is seeing God's will in all of life and helping people recognize that. This goes back to the holistic spirituality. Think about how in this room, how many different occupations are there? Like, think about that. Just look around. We have probably at least 12 different jobs and careers and occupations represented in this room. Break it down even more. We have multiple teachers in this church. So not just teachers. There's different grades, different locations. We have multiple sports that are coached inside of this room. We have different cities in which our occupations are. 
we must learn how to come together and help one another know how to find God's will and apply God's will in their life where they are. Last week I mentioned evangelism and I talked and I have frequently over the years said evangelism is not just inviting kids to a VBS, getting them to say a prayer, and then they leave. Evangelism is part of the process of discipling someone to know and understand how to act, where they act, when they act. We live in a city, here in a story, that has many needs. When Brittany and I moved here, we had a semi-understanding of what the demographics of this community was. We studied it, I studied it, I, I tried to learn it, I tried to recognize because how you meet the needs of the community with the gospel truth changes on the communities. If you're a community of busy people versus not busy people, a community of commuters versus non-commuters, you meet that need differently. And discipleship is part of that whole process of finding how people can have their need met so they can better understand and conform to the will, word, and way of God. I frequently think about the challenge of who is discipling people. Because I've been in so many communities where no matter who you ask, someone will say, oh, I'm a believer, I believe, I know God, I know Jesus. But the actions that I see are the same things that Galatians 5 calls the deeds of the flesh, and I don't see the fruit of the Spirit. Discipleship has to be centered around biblical truth. And with that comes the question, if it's centered around biblical truth, who does it? Is this something that is, next slide, only the pastors and the deacons in a church? Is this the job of only the professional? On well, Matthew 28, 18, as we covered last week, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus says. And then he says, wherever you go, Make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The person who makes disciples, biblically, is the person who has Jesus with them. So does that leave anyone off the hook who is a believer? I see some slight head shakes. Okay. Phrase it again. Can anyone get out of the job of discipling others? No. And in fact, this is where, as I said earlier, the question is who's discipling who? I think one of the big issues of discipleship in America is we as American Christians like our privacy in our space. Our business is our business. Your business is your business. Let's not talk. If we do, it's about something that is seven steps removed from the Bible. And so we're talking about where do I get my hair cut or what's the best brand of tires. Now, the beauty of discipleship is that older men and older women can be helping younger men and younger women, as we see in Titus 2, 1 through 10, Learn how to navigate this world. But that isn't the summary of discipleship is not, hey, we talk about things that don't seem to have eternal significance. Which goes to the question of who needs discipleship? Because I believe oftentimes the driver behind why people aren't discipled is that we all like to think, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm all right. You know, 
I'm better than the person that's worse than me that I compare myself to. You know, like, I'm good. It reminds me of how in high school I used to determine how glad I was or how well I thought a meet went by if no girls beat me at that invitational. <laughs> now, there was this invitational, the Portage Invitational, which was around Labor Day weekend, that had massive, massive amounts of runners. And this was back in the day when the results were posted, not read online, and there's this group of runners from my team that we're all right around bubble. We were a bubble of runners all at the same time. And so we'd all go, and we'd be like, all right, we'd scan the list. All right, this is how fast I went, and then we'd scan the list. And we thought that we did well if no girls beat us. Now, I'm glad to announce that the, by that standard, I usually did okay. But is that the standard of what is a good runner? Is if you do or do not beat someone else? No. Just like the standard of being a good disciple of Jesus is not, who am I better than? Paul declares that he had not yet made it. We saw that in the book of Galatians, Paul and Peter. Paul says that him and Peter had to discuss to understand what the will of God was in that moment. Acts 15, the early church, which had the apostles in it, the people who were so gifted by the Spirit that they were performing miracles without even trying, they still had to discuss what they needed to do to apply God's will where they were. And so I believe the other area of discipleship, of who does it, and who needs it is that we often are afraid of having our view confronted. Change is part of life, but who enjoys change? And like the people who say they enjoy change, change something in their house without telling them. And you'll find out how much they really enjoy change. Paint their door a different color. They're not going to wake up and say, Yahoo. They're going to say, who painted my door? I don't like change. I like improvising and following like, and reacting, but I don't like the changes themselves. But discipleship requires someone who's willing to discuss with someone who's willing to listen. Because as we see in Scripture is if everyone's supposed to be doing it and part of it, yet there's times whenever there's complete disagreement between apostles about something, that discipleship requires humble parties. And so pride is one of the biggest opponents of discipleship. And I put down First and Second Timothy, I think, as great examples of this intersection of discipleship, where Paul disciples Titus in the letters of Titus, or we have Philemon, or First and Second Timothy, where he's literally writing to believers and saying, "Hey, I hear this is going on. You should do this." And he gives scripture, and he says, "People are arguing and fighting about this. Don't. Here's this. So, how do we do it?" Deuteronomy, next slide. Is discipleship a bunch of programs or is it something personal? And this is one of the great debates. Should it, should it be something that's every night at this time or every day at this time? Is it a Bible study that you work through? Is it something that people can graduate from? And I think to answer this question, we just, Deuteronomy 6 says, and this is from the message. I thought this was one of the best ways to emphatically put it. Love God, your God, with your whole heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. Write these commands that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and get them inside your children. Talk about them wherever you are, sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you fall into bed at night. Tie them on your hands and foreheads as a reminder. 
Inscribe them on the doorposts of your home and on your city gates. Deuteronomy 6 says it's both. It's the personal relationships, but then it's the formal Sunday school. It's the formal FCA Bible study. It's the formal Sunday sermon. Discipleship cannot be one or the other. It's both. But if you only have one, then I believe you're unable to do the full range of discipleship. Who is the person that you are conversing about these things with? It says that parents are supposed to be talking about the commands with their children. What do you do when your children aren't in your home? Who are you doing it with? But this is also the beautiful example of how discipleship is the obligation of a parent. And then we as fellow believers see our job as coming along them as they do this. This is also where Deuteronomy 6 says that they're supposed, parents are supposed to be discussing God's commands with their children. That means if you are a father or a mother and you don't know the commands of God in order to be able to talk about them in this way, Scripture is saying you need to be discipled. You need to be studying. You need to be reading. You need to be learning these things so you can have the conversation with your kids. And this is the part that I think we often miss. As the more we dig into knowing the commands of God, knowing the word of God, the more beautiful they become and the more we see we can know. As a coach, I'm continually reminded of all the things about the human body, running, performance, endurance, and strength that I don't know. And each year, it's just this journey of learning. And then I share that with my athletes. And then someday, my athletes are going to come back and coach for me. I saw a head shake. <laughs> Up or down. It was a side to side. I, don't worry. I'll be patient. And I'll find that athlete who will take my spot. But that's also part of discipleship, is finding the person to fill your spot. Which is the next question of, is it, we think that maybe it's information... Or it's all feelings. Is it informational or is it formational? What is discipleship? Because it looks different if you're talking to people. Oftentimes, I think the most beautiful way that I've witnessed discipleship is the older person taking the younger person and having coffee. Usually the teenage to college age student who's having relationship issues that goes and talks to someone who's 10 to 20 years older than them and they pour out their heart and they're all these questions and then the adult lovingly validates emotions are real blah, 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 and then brings scripture into that moment of you know just because jim bob broke up with you doesn't mean that you're not worth life there's no Jim Bob's out here, so I'm not giving any personal stories. Or an interesting story I actually remember from one of my college professors. This Bible speaker came and was speaking whenever at his seminary, and he talked, and he was you know, in his early 20s, and he went and he had a conversation, and just he remembers just talking to this guy about all these things and just all the burdens of his heart. And the guy just lovingly said, well, in your 20s and you'll grow. And one of those things of like, sometimes we just got to be patient because we learn and we grow. And then sometimes the conversation is, yeah, you're an idiot. That was a dumb decision. How do we deal with the fallout from this? Matthew 9, 12 through 13 the, the word for disciple, the verb. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. We cannot call ourselves disciples of Jesus 
If all we want to do is to try to look good or be pious or religious, if we do not think we have a need, if we do not say, I am the sick who needs the doctor, then we are not truly disciples. But also, if we are not learning the heart of the Old Testament law, which is mercy, if we're getting caught up on all the rigmarole, which would be the sacrifice, then we aren't truly stepping into what it means to be a disciple. Isaiah 1 I think it's 15 through 17. The call and the cry is, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's case. The verb for to make disciples or to, the, the verb of to learn, which is what discipleship comes from, is tied in scripture to the application of that knowledge. So, how do you become a better Christian? You need to obviously learn what it means, what right and wrong is, but it's also that formation of, help, of giving people the time and the practice, which is why I have the junior high and the senior high students read scripture. That's a way to disciple them, to honor God's word, and to proclaim God's word. Discipleship in concrete terms means training someone to put their faith in Jesus and then following him and his word and mission in the world. Discipleship is not training someone to be like me. It's I am pursuing Jesus. I'll try to help you do it also. A final slide. Oh, I, that was my long quote that I didn't mean to include today that I want to just show. Next slide after that. I condensed that quote. It's a really good quote, but I condensed it. So discipleship is walking with someone in this green and blue era. You notice that those arrows are overlapping for the vast majority of their way. And I believe this is where we are, is we, we're overlapping what we think the will of God is, which is that, that straight green arrow. But we are in relationship with someone enough that whenever we are falling off from that arrow, that we're able to receive the instruction to get back to the right direction. And then we slowly taper away from that era. Discipleship is the continual teaching of God's word, will, and way as an antidote to our natural inclination to sin and the pull of the world and the snares of Satan. Because of this, it is a call for us all to be involved in it, to teach, and to be taught to equip, and to be equipped. Scripture says that our hearts are desperately wicked. Scripture says that we are not going to be perfect in this world. So that means we are all in need of the continual giving of that antidote. Or to put it in nerdy terms, it's the intersection of of the study of scripture with the context of someone's life. Because I don't know if you guys know it, but the single mom of five kids is going to need a different way of being discipled than the 55-year-old multimillionaire. I'm going to need someone who's going to know how to speak scripture into my life differently than the person who's not 34 and a pastor and a coach. But we all need that antidote. No one's life is above it, but that's the life context. Discipleship is the joining of the meaning of Scripture 
with where someone's life is so they can apply it. It's the journey of application. Now, at Grace Bible Church, we don't have scores of formal programs of discipleship. But we do have people in our church who've been walking with Jesus a lot of decades. Discipleship is both looking up to someone and finding them and also seeking people out. So if you are an older believer, you can be very informal in your discipleship of just having conversations along the way. You can be formal and in inviting someone to a meal, inviting someone along to participate in things that you're doing. I still remember whenever I was working with Youth for Christ, just riding in the truck with Ken Mills to go pick up items that we we're going to use for the clubs. And clubs is in like smaller gatherings, not like clubs is in like disco music and bad stuff. Like disco ball, they're trying to speak to Randy's era. Um, not that club, Randy. And just having those conversations where the Christian radio's on and I'd say, I don't know about this line in this song. And we'd talk about the line and is this biblical, is this not biblical, what does it mean? Discipleship can be as informal or formal as you want. It's also a need. But it has to be relational. Which is part of why I think something like men's coffee time is a perfect example of just people together talking. Sharing their needs. Praying. Talking about the application of scripture together. We're mutually feeding into each other's life. 